South Korea is set to report over 3,000 new COVID-19 infections on Monday, slightly inching down from the previous date. And beginning today, vaccine passes will only be valid for six months for those inoculated with one or two-shot regimen. Amid the rampant spread of the Omicron variant, Europe's cumulative COVID-19 cases topped 100 million as of Sunday, accounting for more than a third of total infections around the world. And South Korean President Moon Jae-in is set to deliver the final New Year's address of his term in the coming hours. It's believed he will highlight the importance of national unity and efforts to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. Hello and welcome to this Monday edition of New Day at Adidang. It's 8 a.m. on January 3rd, 2022. A new week in a new year here in Seoul, South Korea. Thank you ever so much for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. And I'm Kim Mulgan. Over the next hour, we'll take a look at the big news stories of the day and get expert insights on the issues facing Korea and the world. We start with the coronavirus situation here in South Korea. It's the first Monday of 2022, and we are seeing a continuous downtrend in the number of new infections. However, officials say it's still too early to let our guard down. Now, that's because the spread of the Delta and the highly transmissible variant Omicron still pose a serious threat. For more on this and other updates, our reporter Shin Yeun is here in the studio with us. Good morning, Yeun. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you both. Happy New Year. So, Yeun, let's start with the local tally for today. Right, so Mugyeon, we're expecting the daily tally to surpass 3,000 up until 9 p.m. Sunday. We recorded 2,977 infections. Now, this was down by 604 from what had been reported the same time the day before, and also down by over 1,900 from a week ago. But as you mentioned, the Omicron variant continues to be a concern. Yesterday, we saw 93 fresh Omicron cases, bringing the total tally above 1,200. In just a month, South Korea's total Omicron tally has surpassed past 1,000, a transmission rate 2.5 times faster than Delta. Now, yeah, in, um South Korean authorities have uh, tightened up their antivirus regulations. They kick in today. Give us the details on that. Right. So these new measures are like a new policy on vaccine passes, which will take effect to encourage more people to get their booster shots. An expiration date will be implemented, which means vaccine passes will only be valid for six months for those who've completed a one or two dose vaccine regimen. In other words, after six months have passed since a person received their final jab, they would now need to get a booster shot in order to enter most public places. Now, this includes those who are fully vaccinated before July. A one week grace period will be imposed though to avoid any confusion but once that grace period is over those who violate this policy will be fined and like always people can certify their vaccination status when visiting different public facilities like restaurants and cafes using the Coov app. The app will show whether one has been fully vaccinated for more than 14 days or whether it has been over 180 days since they've received their last jabs and devices reading vaccination statuses will make a ding dong sound if a person is not fully vaccinated or when their vaccination certificate has expired. To avoid any complications, authorities have asked everyone to update their Coov app to the latest version in advance. Also, authorities have decided to extend vaccine passes for department stores and big supermarkets from January 10th and extend them to 12 to 18 year olds from March 1st. So, Yen, alongside the vaccine passes, authorities have also um, extended the current social distancing measures that were supposed to be lifted on January 2nd. Tell us more on that. Right. The extended measures include limiting social gatherings to four people and restricting business operations to 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., uh, 9 p.m. for restaurants, cafes, indoor sports facilities, and 10 p.m. for academies, PC rooms, or party rooms. Now, there has been a change in the operation hour for movie theaters and performance halls, though. Previously, these venues were required to close at 10 p.m., but now they can allow customers to enter up to 9 p.m. as long as performances and movies end before midnight. All these restrictions have been extended for another two weeks, meaning they'll last until January 16th. Now, we're into year three of this pandemic now, and it's a question on many people's lips. When do we expect this pandemic to finally come to an end? 
Right, definitely. It's a question that many is asking, but unfortunately, many local experts said it will be difficult to see a complete end of COVID-19 anytime soon, especially since we continue to see new mutations of the virus. But some good news is that we've passed major milestones in the development of COVID-19 treatments. Experts have said the more effective the vaccines or treatments are, the more likely we'll be able to return to life without as many social distancing restrictions. Now, many said COVID-19 should be treated like like a common flu, which means that we should no longer separate those infected with COVID-19 and treat them at hospitals. Instead, COVID-19 patients should be treated at home with medications to stop them from developing critically ill symptoms. South Korea has already secured more than 360,000 courses of antiviral pills from Pfizer and around 240,000 from Merck. They'll secure an extra 400,000 at the beginning of this month. And Prime Minister Kim bu gum said these oral treatments will be available for use as early as mid-January or the end of this month. Well, that's some good news. Well, Yin, anyway, thank you for your report. We'll hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, as always, Yin, for that reporting. Now, the world is continuing to do what it can to stem the rampant spread of COVID-19. Now, the global hotspot is Europe, and that continent has just topped 100 million cumulative cases of the virus. And this comes as France and the UK have reported new daily records over the past few days. Kim hyo Sun has this report. Europe's cumulative COVID-19 cases topped 100 million as of Sunday, accounting for more than a third of the world's total infections. According to an AFP tally, the region has logged nearly 5 million cases over the past week alone, with over a dozen countries reporting record numbers over the past days due to the rampant spread of the highly transmissible Omicron variant. France, for example, reported over 20,000 new cases on Saturday, the fourth consecutive day that the country reported a daily tally of over 20,000. It has now become the world's sixth country to report over 10 million cumulative cases since the pandemic broke out. Against this backdrop, the French government has ramped up measures in an effort to curb the spread of the virus in the new year, including limits on gatherings and a ban on food and drink at multi-use facilities. In the UK, secondary school students will have to wear face masks in classrooms once again as the country also faces a surge caused by Omicron. The British government said the measure will be enforced until January 26th when a new set of COVID-19 measures will be announced. It explained this would maximize the number of children in school and the amount of time they spend on school as well. In China, new cases in the lockdown city of Xi'an have fallen to their lowest in a week as its 13 million residents face their 11th day under strict home confinement. 122 new infections were reported on Sunday, a slight drop from the previous day. Meanwhile, Israel is grappling with the spread of Omicron, with around 1.3 million cases documented so far since the onset of the pandemic. Health experts, however, warn between 2 to 4 million people may be infected by the end of January. The warning comes as daily infections have more than quadrupled over the past 10 days. Hoping to contain the spread, Israel has recommended a fourth dose of the COVID-19 vaccine for all citizens over 60, as well as for health workers, at least four months after their third jab. The move is set to receive final approval by the health ministry in the coming days. Kim Yusan, Arirang News. Now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. South Korea's new daily COVID-19 cases, as we've been hearing, have been on a downtrend in recent weeks. There have been fears the number of new infections could explode, but so far that is yet to materialize. However, more than 1,000 people are still critically ill, with that figure remaining over the 1,000 mark for about two weeks straight now, putting a lot of strain on the healthcare system. Also from today, Proof of vaccination required for access to certain facilities only valid for six months after the primary series or booster shots. The vaccine pass is required to enter restaurants, cafes, movie theaters and other similar sized places. And this will be widened to department stores and large supermarkets from January 10th. For more, we connect to Dr. Alice Tan, internist at Ms. Medi Women's Hospital in Seoul. Good morning, Dr. Tan. Good morning. 
So, Doctor, let's start with a downturn in new infections. The widely anticipated uptick didn't really seem to have come. What do you think about it? Well, certainly we are on the downslope of the second half of the Delta surge that started on November 1st. We peaked on December 15th in terms of new cases, and the peak in terms of ICU cases and deaths occurred predictably one week after. Uh, but, you know, I think this is due to the control of this uh, last wave is due to a wide deployment of third shot boosters and also increased social restrictions. But I would hardly say we are out of the woods. Only 34% uh, of our total population has received a third shot booster. Uh, and although these restrictions and the widespread deployment of boosters has buffered, these have buffered the spread of the Omicron variant, what we're seeing is a troubling uh, nearly daily doubling of new uh, community sporadic Omicron cases. The number is going from 1 to 11 to 25 to 43 new sporadic uh, Omicron cases. So uh, I, I think that we will start to see a new surge uh, either next week or starting in mid-January. Hopefully, um, it will not lead to the kinds of hospitalizations and deaths that we saw during the month of December. But um, I, I think it's coming. I don't think it's uh, something that we can avoid. And turning to these vaccine passes, what are your thoughts on the fact that they're only going to be valid for uh, six months now after the most recent shot or the booster? And do you think this will be a temporary measure or do you think this is something that's going to become permanent? Well, according to uh, recent data from the Imperial College of London, uh, two shots of the AstraZeneca or the Pfizer vaccines offer only 0 to 20 percent vaccine effectiveness against infection uh, from the Omicron variant. Uh, there is higher level of vaccine effectiveness against hospitalizations, but um, basically two shots are not enough to to protect against the Omicron. Uh, so at some point when the overall risk due to COVID in our country becomes very, very low, uh, at some point we will no longer need this vaccine pass system. But it's very hard to predict when that will come. Uh, we don't know if there will be a next variant of concern similar to Omicron that um, requires us to have another, say, fourth shot of a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and so for the time being, I think it does make sense to have an expiration date on the vaccine pass after just after two doses, because it's not going to be enough to pr protect against Omicron. So Dr. Tan, um, what would you like to say to those people who are unvaccinated and who were fully vaccinated, but are hesitant to take their booster shots? Right. So first of all, to the uh, around 7 million people who have not even started uh, vaccinations, um, you know, COVID will, will probably find you. Uh, and it's not a benign disease, uh, even though Omicron does seem to lead to fewer hospitalizations. It's not a benign disease. It still leads to ICU cases. It still leads to people on ventilators and it can still cause death. Uh, the vaccines are safe. Three shots of the vaccine does seem to protect against Omicron. It certainly protects against hospitalizations, against even Omicron and the Delta variant. So please help our country get back on the road to the return to normal by starting vaccination, uh, because otherwise, COVID will find you. And it's not just uh, acute COVID that we're worried about. Uh, long COVID, long haul COVID is a very, can be a very debilitating condition. So we want to try to avoid that as much as possible and vaccines are the way out. Right, and PCR tests have been improved here in South Korea. We reported on it just last week that now they can detect all five variants, including Omicron, and they can do so 
much faster. But are we still seeing the majority of new cases here in South Korea being the Delta variant? And for people who may have already had Delta or previous variants of COVID-19, can they still contract Omicron? Uh, right, that's a very good question. So, so far, uh, Delta is still the predominant variant in South Korea. But as I said, we are seeing more and more sporadic uh, community cases pop up um, throughout the country. And I think that's the most troubling thing is that uh, the hotspots seem to be in the provinces where the healthcare systems may not be as robust. Uh, in terms of you know, when will Omicron become dominant? I think it will happen sometime in January. Uh, the Omicron variant does seem to evade even natural infection. So having had a prior infection of COVID-19 will not protect against the Omicron variant. Uh, however, uh, perhaps the good news is that uh, infection with the Omicron does seem to protect against the Delta variant. But it's, you know, we can't say that Omicron will protect against the next emerging variant that, you know, the, the uh, next emerging variant X that we, we haven't identified yet. Uh, and so that's why even if you've been infected, you should definitely get vaccinated because that will help protect you against both infection and also hospitalization. So, Dr. Tan, before we let you go, let me just ask you this. Um, we know it's hard to make predictions, but do you have some optimism that the year 2022, we're going to see some things getting better in terms of COVID-19? Yes, I do think that the impact of COVID-19 in our lives overall will decrease. I have high hopes for the oral antiviral pills that should be available hopefully sometime within this month. Uh, but there's just too much of the world that has not even received a first shot of a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and then the high levels of transmission that we're seeing in Europe, in the U.S., uh, that just means that we'll see more variants. Um, that's, that's almost inevitable. So although COVID will be, uh, I think, less of a, a deadly disease as time goes on, um, I'm not sure that 2022 will be the end of the pandemic. I hope so, but um, it, it doesn't look likely. Okay, uh, Dr. Tan, a bit of a pessimistic note to end, but thank you very much for your insights as always. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you. In other news, South Korean President Moon Jae-in will give the final New Year's address of his term in the coming hours. Officials say he will highlight the importance of national unity and efforts to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic during the 20-minute speech that's scheduled to begin at 10 a.m. local time. It will be followed by a virtual New Year greeting inviting the Prime Minister, National Assembly Speaker, Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court, head of the National Election Commission, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, as well as the leaders of political parties and businesses as well. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un started his first day of the new year at the Gumsusan Palace of the Sun, the resting place of his two predecessors. According to the state-run Rodong Shimun, Kim delivered what the paper called sacred New Year's greetings to the eternal leaders, his grandfather, the regime's founder, Kim Il-sung, and his father, Kim Jong-il. Accompanying him was his younger sister, Kim Yo-jung, and top officials from the ruling Workers' Party. They reportedly strengthened their pledge to make 2022 a revolutionary year that serves as a turning point in the leading North Korea towards a prosperous future. The new year brings with it a number of changes from new rules and policies to how many days off we'll have in 2022. Our Kim bo gives us a rundown of what we can expect. How many days off can we expect in the new year? This year, there are 67 red-marked bank holidays, the same as last year. 52 Sundays added with 19 national holidays makes 71.
but four holidays that fall on Sundays, Buddha's birthday, the day after Chuseok, Hangul Day, and Christmas need to be excluded. Unfortunately, Buddha's birthday and Christmas are public holidays but are not subject to substitute holidays. Instead, two more holidays have been added, the day of the presidential election on March 9th and local election day in June. Meanwhile, private companies with more than five and fewer than 30 employees need to guarantee that public and substitute holidays are paid days off. Previously, Public holidays for private companies were not legally paid holidays. But depending on the size of the company, the rule now applies to more workplaces. Public institutions and companies with more than 300 employees introduced the system starting the beginning of 2020, while companies with more than 30 and less than 300 began on the first day of 2021. Drivers might not have to worry about carrying an actual driver's license. The Ministry of the Interior and Safety and the Korean National Police Agency will start issuing mobile driver's licenses starting the end of January for those who take their test at two driver's license test facilities. It is expected that the mobile license will be issued to 10,000 people who pass their test during a five-month trial period, before being expanded nationwide in July. Korean teens will also be freed from the online gaming curfew. According to the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family, the gaming curfew, the so-called the shutdown law, will be officially abolished as of the first day of 2022. The revised act will no longer make it illegal for game providers to offer games to children under the ages of 16 between 12 a.m. and 6 a.m. The law has been in effect since 2011 to protect underage children from possible game addiction, but has been controversial as some said it puts constraints on an individual's rights. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. Now we cross over to our OCR for global insight and an in-depth look at important developments in world affairs. Thanks, Mark. It's time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world to hear their views on issues making headlines. We begin the week and the new year by discussing the prospects for inter-Korean relations here on the peninsula. And South Korean President Moon Jae-in makes his New Year speech on Monday morning, his fourth and final one as his term draws to an end. And throughout his presidency, he's been pushing for the improvement of cross-border ties and even a peace declaration between the two sides to end the 1950-53 to 53 Korean War. But despite his strenuous efforts and heavy spending of national resources to woo the North, little has changed. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's own New Year address was made over the weekend, but it indicated that inter-Korean ties may not be on the top of Pyongyang's priority list right now. So what lies ahead for South and North Korea this year? For this, we connect with Rachel Min Young Lee, non-resident fellow with the 38 North program at the Stimson Center. Very warm, well, a very warm welcome to you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Well, my first question to you, uh, Rachel Lee, is the North Korean leader. Now, he usually mentions South Korea and the United States in his New Year address, and it sets the tone for the North policy uh, for its external relations. And it also, um, he also emphasizes nuclear development, of course. However, the focus of his speech this year, it seemed to be on food and the economy. Now, we know that there's a food crisis going on in the North. So how severe is the situation and why has it been so difficult to improve it? I don't think anybody can say for sure how bad the food situation right, is right now, um, given a dearth of reliable data. But I think we can say that the food situation is pretty bad because the top leader uh, has acknowledged a tense food situation and has released military emergency military rice reserves. Um, there are a number of reasons why in North Korea's uh, food situation has been bad over the years and why it hasn't been improved. Um, deforestation, poor disaster management, um, and uh, fertilizer shortages. Uh, most recently, uh, the national lockdown um, has made it difficult uh, for regular trade to take place. For example, China's food exports to North Korea have uh, fallen by 80% since the start of the pandemic. Also, the national lockdown has made it difficult for international food um, agency workers to operate normally in, in, in the country. 
And well, last year in December, Kim Jong-un marked uh, 10 years of leading the regime after his father passed away in 2011. But that doesn't seem to be much to celebrate right now, given the current circumstances. And last year, Kim Jong-un publicly admitted that the regime had failed to achieve its economic development goals of improving its people's livelihoods and that there was also a severe food shortage. He also seemed to be a bit on edge, uh, clamping down on anti-socialist material, as the regime called it, and um, anti-socialist culture as well. So, well, this is a question that's been asked time and time again, but how stable do you think the uh, Kim Jong-un regime is? And if he fails to make progress on resolving domestic difficulties, do you think the current power structure can actually survive? Um, this sounds really ironic, but um, despite all of the economic difficulties, um, Kim Jong-un seems to be uh, fully in power. The regime seems stable. Uh, he remains fully in charge of the institution and the system that prop up his um, leadership. The one thing, one important thing we need to understand about the Pyongyang regime is that North Korea, regi North Korea is one large um, resilient institution tailored to the survival of the Kim family. Um, it has withstood multiple storms throughout history. For example, it survived the arduous march or the famine um, in the 1990s. It um, survived years of international sanctions and most recently two years of national lockdown. Many experts have um, speculated that the national lockdown will practically kill the Kim regime, but it still goes it still remains strong. Um, there's also the China factor that we need to remember. Um, China will never let North Korea collapse. And as long as that policy stands, North Korea will somehow muddle through. And well, it seemed that North Korea and China were resuming some uh, trade activities in the borders. And, but then uh, this year, Seoul and Washington, though, uh, they only got a passing mention in Kim Jong-un's speech. And uh, what he said about uh, relations with South Korea and the United States it seemed relatively benign compared to the rather dramatic and threatening language used in the past. So what would this really, in, what does this indicate to you? Um, there has been no significant change in North Korea's domestic situation or the external circumstances surrounding um, North Korea. So rather than changing its South Korea policy or its foreign policy, um, I think the North Korea's strategy right now is to maintain a wait and see approach vis-a-vis um, -vis Seoul and Washington while it keeps um, focusing on resolving domestic issues. Um, when the time is right, North Korea will um, go for a policy shift um, towards Seoul and Washington. Um, but right now there are too many unknowns um, the South Korean presidential election in March, for one thing, um, and U.S.-China relations remain volatile. Um, so they'll, they'll wait for an opportunity. And when the time is right, I think they will make a policy shift. Um, what we need to remember is that Kim Jong-un in his December 2019 party plenum uh, report said that he was gearing up for a long-term confrontation with the U.S. So Pyongyang is not in a hurry. Well, the ruling uh, Workers' Party held a, plan uh, held a series of planning sessions last week and they apparently discussed the 2022 budget for the North Korean regime. And well, with the uh, current coronavirus crisis, food shortages and you know, um, economic uh, difficulties, do you think the regime is going to have to make some cutbacks on its nuclear weapons program? It's hard to say North Korea, um, because North Korea's budgetary figures remain so opaque. Uh, North Korea's official um, annual defense spending stands at about 15.8%. And that doesn't really tell us much because that number rarely ever changes. And besides, there is the unofficial defense um, spending that we know nothing about. And um, from what we can tell, and this is probably the most important thing, um, economic difficulties have not stopped the Kim regime from developing nuclear weapons and missiles over the years. Um, I think the real question here, and the more interesting question here is one of um, civilian versus defense spending. Whether the Kim regime is willing to reduce def defense spending and reallocate more resources um, to um, the national, well, to the, the civilian economic sectors, to revise the national economy and um, to breathe life into economic reform. And based on the amount of um, focus on the economy, 
um, in the latest party plenum readout and also based on North Korean state media's uh, continued endorsement of uh, economic reform. I think we can say that um, North Korea will at least try to um, reallocate more resources toward um, the civilian economic sectors. Well, South Korean President Moon Jae-in, he's been pushing for a peace declaration and hoping for some Olympic diplomacy in Beijing. But neither the US or North Korea, they don't seem particularly enthused by the idea and only China seems uh, happy about the proposition. Do you think it's possible for South Korea to make any kind of progress on re-engaging the North uh, before this current administration leaves office? Unfortunately, I'm skeptical that the Moon administration will make any substantial progress in inter-Korean relations before the presidential election um, in March. Um, if North Korea intended to give one more shot at improving inter-Korean relations before um, President Moon leaves office, I think we would have seen some more language on South Korea and the party plenum readout, which we didn't. Um, it's possible that Kim Jong-un doesn't see the point of dealing with a president who only has four months left in office. Um, and with regard to the US, it is possible that Pyongyang wants to focus on resolving issues at home first and is not ready to resume diplomacy with Washington. But all in all, North Korea likely will not re-engage um, Washington unless it can get something tangible out of the U.S., uh, for example, the lifting of key economic sanctions and uh, the suspension of U.S. ROK joint military drills. One thing we need to keep in mind is that the failure of the Hanoi summit um, has had a far-reaching um, policy impact um, in, in terms of the, how, how Kim Jong-un postured himself um, domestically and um, in terms of foreign policy. Um, and I think that it's unlikely that he will go for um, diplomacy until he knows for sure that he, he can get something tangible out of uh, re-engagement. Well, as you said, it seems quite unclear how the um, presidential uh, election will turn out in South Korea and how that's going to affect inter-Korean relations. But it's quite clear right now that the front-running candidates won't be as invested in inter-Korean relations as President Moon Jae-in was. And uh, over the years, the North has actually continued its provocative behaviour in nuclear tests, missile tests, um, and hasn't committed to denuclearization, regardless of who was in the Blue House. So to what extent have engagement policies worked or not worked on the North? I think despite uh, the Moon administration's good intentions, its engagement policy and the three rounds of uh, summits with Kim Jong-un have resulted in no substantial progress in inter-Korean relations. North Korea continued to perfect its nuclear and missile programs during the Moon administration. Um, Pyongyang even blew up the joint liaison office in Kaesong, uh, which was a fruit of the first Kim Moon summit in uh, Panmunjom in 2018. And all of these actions by North Korea took place after the three rounds of summits where the two leaders uh, pledged to defuse um, tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And well, um, even during the, uh, the summit diplomacy between um, the US and North Korea in 2018, it seemed that Kim Jong-un was more interested in talking to then President Trump rather than President Moon Jae-in. And well, irrespective of who will be elected as South Korea's next president, do you see North Korea moving to restore inter-Korean dialogue anytime soon? Um, I think that depends on two factors. Um, number one, how Pyongyang perceives the, the North Korea policy of the South Korean president-elect. And secondly, how desperate North Korea is for increased cooperation with the outside world besides China's. Um, North Korea says quarantine remains a top priority, and that implies that it will continue to maintain its national border, a lockdown in place. And um, that implies to me that the country is muddling through somehow and that it can afford to keep its borders closed. And all of that said, I think Pyongyang likely will um, bide its time and see when it feels like it can gain something tangible and then it will um, posture itself for re-engagement with Seoul. And do you think for the time being, uh, with it's, you know, just bad economic conditions and also this COVID-19 pandemic crisis, of course, do you think the North is going to keep a low profile for a while? Or um, do you see a possibility of the regime launching yet another major provocation? First of all, at some point, North Korea will resume um, testing the big weapons, they are part of the country's five-year defense development plan. So it's a matter of time and not a matter of if. 
Um, that said, these weapons have to be first, the first have to be ready to be tested. And secondly, in terms of um, the timing of the testing, it seems unlikely to me that North Korea will carry out any major provocations early in the year. Um, short range missile tests are possible, but anything beyond that, probably not. Um, it will not want to be viewed by China as uh, throwing cold water over the Beijing Olympics by um, carrying out major provocations and therefore escalating tensions in the region. Um, and in terms of the South Korean presidential election, um, I think that carrying out a major provocation will only help bolster the national security agenda of the conservatives. Um, and Pyongyang likely won't, will not want to be doing that. Um, right now, uh, U.S. President Joe Biden is, uh, you know, he's being, his time is being um, taken up by Ukraine, uh, Iran, other major foreign policy uh, issues. Do you think he's, how do you think he's going to pursue um, talks with the North or any progress on the denuclearization front? I think we will see more or less the same um, approach. Um, in, I, as you know, Washington has been calling for talks um, with North Korea without any conditions. Um, and unfortunately, North Korea does have some uh, preconditions. Um, and as I said before, Pyongyang wants a step-by-step -step approach where, phase-by-phase -phase approach where when it does something, it wants something in return. And Pyongyang, in Pyongyang's mind, it has already taken some good measures such as the moratorium on nuclear missile testing, um, the repatriation of US uh, soldiers' remains. Um, so it's now Washington's turn to give something in return. And I don't think the Biden administration is ready to do that. Well, that was Rachel Minyongi, non-resident fellow with the 38 North program at the Stimson Centre. Thank you again so much for your time and have a happy new year. Thank you for having me. Happy new year. The Consumer Electronics Show 2022 kicks off Wednesday in Las Vegas, but... We'll close a day earlier than normal due to COVID-19. Over 2,200 firms will be at the event with 195 Fortune 500 companies taking part. Over 400 South Korean firms are also going to be there either online or offline. That's the largest number yet. An executive from Samsung Electronics will give a speech at the opening ceremony under the theme of Together for Tomorrow. Germany has criticised the European Commission's plans to include nuclear energy and natural gas in its long-awaited green labelling system for investment in the energy sector. Germany's ministers of economy and climate protection as well as environment have slammed the initiative, saying Berlin cannot back the proposal. The draft, which was sent to EU countries last Friday, says nuclear plants should be considered, quote, sustainable if the host country can ensure they cause no significant harm to the environment. Austria and Luxembourg also oppose the move. A wildfire in the U.S. state of Colorado, fueled by high winds, has reportedly destroyed almost 1,000 homes north of the city of Denver. Local police say three people are believed to be missing. The county sheriff suggesting that they are also likely dead. But he said it was fortunate that the list of missing people was much, uh, not much longer. The recovery efforts have been hampered by snow. President Biden has approved a disaster declaration for the state, which will free up resources to help. 2021 was the year of the white cow, an animal closely associated with honesty, faithfulness and patience. But now we have ushered in the year of the black tiger. And according to our Chen Minjiang, many are looking forward to receiving the tiger's courageous energy with hopes for a better year. 2022 is the year of the black tiger. It's called Iminyan in Korean, Im meaning black and In meaning tiger. Six months ahead of the new year, South Korea celebrated the birth of five tigers. These six-month-old baby tigers are very special. In a very rare case, five of them were born at the same time, when usually Korean tigers give birth to only two to three cubs at once. It's very fortunate for us to have five newborn endangered tigers at once. We hope people can receive good energy from these Korean tigers and have a healthy year of the tiger in 2022. 
The tiger has long been in our lives as one of the animals that represent the Korean identity. From ancient times, the tiger was considered not only a symbol of strength and power, but also a guardian of the Korean people. Each year is represented by a different animal. The tiger is the third of the 12 zodiac animals coming after the cow. In celebration of the year 2022, the National Folk Museum of Korea is holding a special exhibition that tells many stories of the tiger. There are creatures that represent each country. The dragon for China, the lion for Egypt, and there is, of course, the tiger for Korea. In the olden times, the tiger symbolized bravery and has been worshipped as a mountain god that guards the village. People would have paintings or talismans of the tiger as a tool to defeat misfortune. In folktales and oral traditions, the tiger was considered a mystical creature that is generous and likes to return favors. The tiger is still used as a symbol of South Korea today. It was used as a mascot for international sporting events in Korea, Hodori from the 1988 Seoul Olympics and Suorang from the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. South Korea's national soccer team, also known as the Tigers of Asia, use a tiger emblem as their badge. The Folk Museum has collaborated with video game company Nexon so that people can play the game The Kingdom of the Winds, featuring a tiger character. Since 2020, many people suffered from the pandemic, so we hope that people can get lots of energy from the tiger through this exhibition. Based on the zodiac animal, some Koreans find fortune tellers to predict what awaits them in the new year for fun. When it comes to the year-end, people in Korea usually follow a custom of unraveling the good virtues and attributes of the animals of that year. In Korean culture, the zodiac symbolizes a person's destiny and it's a cultural element for good luck. One fortune teller read what to expect for 2022. If we were to make an analogy using the sea, the first half of 2022 would be months of big stormy waves. The country may face economic, political and cultural problems. From July onward, the turmoil will settle down, small business owners will recover from their struggles and COVID-19 will settle down. Businesses have also been creative to commemorate the Year of the Tiger. Korea Post has made two New Year stamps, one depicting an image of a tiger stretching for a new leap and a face portraying its courageous energy. The Korea Minting and Security Printing Corporation has also unveiled the Tiger Silver Medal, the first product in a series of silver banknotes with the theme of the 12 zodiac signs. It says this was created so people can send meaningful gifts to loved ones in the new year. To attract customers, shops, cafes, and convenience stores have also made special editions of their products and promotions under the theme of the tiger. There have been many ups and downs in 2021 with the prolonged COVID-19 pandemic. However, many Koreans are still holding out hope for a better 2022. 2021 has been a difficult year for the public as well as medical staff because of COVID-19. I hope that the pandemic will settle down in 2022 so that people and medical workers can have a better life. Medical workers and the city of Seoul are working hard to take care of COVID-19 patients, so we hope that life will return to normal in 2022. <laughs> Others are hoping the Year of the Tiger brings happiness for their family and friends.
저는 여자친구 살고 싶습니다. 저 제가 하는 일이 잘 됐으면 좋겠어요. 저는 저희 우정이 영원히 함께했으면 좋겠어요. <웃음> 하나, 둘, 셋. 해피 뉴이어 우리의 우정 포에버. 최민정 아리랑 뉴스. 렛츠 테이크 룩 at what's going on in the world now. A massive fire broke out at South Africa's parliament in Cape Town on Sunday morning. causing structural damage to the National Assembly building as well as the lower house. Authorities say Cape Town's fire and rescue services received a call in the early morning with around 60 firefighters with specialized equipment and six fire trucks being dispatched to the scene. Initial reports indicated that the fire started at an office space located on the third floor. According to a police spokesperson, a man has been arrested on charges of arson, breaking and entering, and theft and will appear in court on Tuesday. The suspect is also expected to be charged under the National Key Points Act, which protects sites of strategic importance. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, who visited the scene, called the incident a terrible and devastating event, as he vowed the parliament's work would continue. The building's sprinkler system had not functioned properly, causing a rapid spread of the fire. Paris's major landmarks were lit up in blue and adorned with EU flags on Saturday, marking the celebration of the start of France's six-month presidency of the European Union. This includes sites like the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, the French Senate and the Louvre Museum. Major landmarks in other cities like Lyon, Marseille, Bordeaux and Strasbourg were also lit up in blue to mark the occasion. However, one of the displays drew major criticism from far-right leader Marine Le Pen, who protested against the placing of the European Union flag on the Arc de Triomphe, calling it an attack on French identity. She was also joined by other right-wing politicians who were outraged by the EU flag fluttering on the Paris landmark. Le Pen says she would appeal to the Council of State, which acts as a legal advisor to the executive to remove the EU flag. The right-wing leader is considered to be President Emmanuel Macron's main rival in the upcoming spring presidential election. Nobel Peace Prize winner and South Africa's anti-apartheid leader Archbishop Desmond Tutu was laid to rest at dawn on Sunday in the Cape Town Cathedral where he once preached against white minority rule. According to an Anglican Church statement on Sunday, his ashes were interred at St. George's Cathedral in a private family service. The service comes after family, friends, clergy, and politicians, including the South African president, attended a requiem mass on Saturday. Tutu's remains were placed beneath an inscribed memorial stone before the high altar. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Good morning. Dress warmly on this first working day of the new year. Temperatures have dropped sharply in central parts of the country with a cold wave advisory issued. Drier air continues to greet most of the eastern regions and further east is under dry warning. That's including Busan and Ulsan. So please be extra careful with anything that could cause a fire. Morning temperatures are 4 to 8 degrees lower than the same time yesterday in central areas. And Chuncheon is born chillingly cold at minus 12 degrees Celsius this morning. Sunny skies to start the day with a chance of snow flurries in the capital and Gangwon-do province late at night. Daytime highs will be 1 to 3 degrees lower this afternoon, at least jumping to positive territory for central regions. Seoul and Chuncheon will go up to 2 degrees this afternoon. Temperatures will return to norms on Wednesday, then the overall the weather looks promising this week under mostly sunny skies in most areas. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
And that's all we have for now. We'll be back at 8 a.m. Korea time on Tuesday for our next edition of New Day at Arirang. We appreciate you tuning in. I'm Kim mo -gyan. Yes, thank you for joining us. We'll be here all week at the same time, 8 a.m. Korea time. And I'll be back in around an hour with live coverage of President Moon Jae-in's final New Year's speech. Until next time, goodbye.